thank you to all your subscribers who are making this channel grow, helping this channel grow. Uh, we're over 100 now. Uh, this channel has got uh, has seen a bit of growth. Um, trying to reach into the thousands if possible. Um, and I say that not because I don't monetize this channel. I don't make any money from ad revenue. I don't have any sponsors and will not have any sponsors. It's not that. It's just, it's just it, uh, it gives great satisfaction when you're doing something and uh, people are <clears throat> responding and it spreads. And that gives me great satisfaction and it's one of the reasons why I uh, continue to do this, uh, do videos on YouTube. It didn't start this way, it kind of evolved this way. I started this channel during the COVID period just so I could contact uh, family, friends and supporters while whilst I was in Thailand and couldn't travel. And now because the channel is growing and I'm getting a lot of good feedback and we've had a lot of other projects um, <clears throat> kind of uh, kind of start and finish and, and, and uh, certain things uh, were born and, and, they, and, and they ended, but we've got uh, two projects still going as a, as a result of me starting this channel. And uh, I just want to kind of talk about that a little bit before I go into the topic of today's video. I don't usually do a lot of updates. If you look in, <coughs> if you look in my uh, uh, in the list of videos, you'll see that I do an update every now and again. And sometimes I'll I'll crunch a little update in front of a video that or a topic that like today, but I don't usually do it. Um, so please be patient and. Uh, tolerant. Um, I need to get uh, the word out sometimes. I need to let people know what I'm doing and give people uh, updates, uh, particularly uh, I'm not easy to contact. I'm in a situation where I shouldn't be on social media and things like this. So I do it through uh, YouTube and I do it through um, a newly created website called Buddhist.cafe. Now, I have over 100 subscribers here now. Um, there should be over 100 subscribers on Buddhist.cafe now as well, um, because that site is built for Buddhism um, to help develop Buddhism in a lot of ways, right? And so I've spoken about this. You can see videos on this, so I won't go over that again. But please go over there and subscribe. I just need you to know, though, there are two things. You have to subscribe. Well, you, you subscribe to get in, and then you, if you want membership to be able to access all the features, you need to request membership. Now, unfortunately, this is not a fun thing to do, but we did it because we created the system this way in order to uh, eliminate as much as possible spam and bots, uh, because that's a big problem these days on these sites. So usually, um, we've I've had sites before where people can just subscribe and they're just in and there's no issues. Um, but now there's this this uh, phenomenon with bots and spam accounts and people just having temporary email accounts, logging in, um, trying to get information, things like this, um, or and bots where they suck data or like a, a memory or something. I don't know. Anyway, we had to create the system this way. So remember, there's two things. You subscribe. Once you subscribe, you request membership. Okay, that's really important. Um, and then you can create a group, you can join a group. We've got a few features on there right now uh, and we're working towards improving the site all the time. Um, but the aim in there is to create a, a, a Buddhist community, uh, international Buddhist community, which hopefully will kind of uh, trigger off or create, will extend into local areas, right? Because meeting people in your local area, that kind of thing to do things and stuff like this. So please, uh, if you haven't already, please go over to Buddhist.cafe and uh, join there and uh, join the community. Help me help me grow uh, this vision that uh, I've created for any monk, any Buddhist person, anywhere, any tradition, by the way. So this channel is my little channel where I get to express uh, my personal views on things, my opinions, and where I get to do my own little thing. But Buddhist Cafe is not uh, for that. Although I've got a group set up on Buddhist Cafe, which allows me to get off all the apps 
which is a real advantage for any monk as well, I think. Um, so, yes, I've got a group there, and you can contact me there for sure. But uh, any person can create a group. Anyone, it's it's just like a, a just another social site. But uh, it uh, it uh, its focus is just Buddhism. Um, so yeah, if if you if you feel inclined, please go ahead. If you uh, are really interested in Buddhism, you know this this site is is a really good site to uh, be part of. Okay, and you're helping me uh, uh, spread Buddhism and uh, create opportunities for Buddhists in general. So just go and have a look. Okay, once again, it's Buddhist.cafe. Now today's topic uh, was uh, a question that was in the comments. Shout out to Love Udon. Love Udon, thank you. And shout out to all the people um, uh, uh, writing comments uh, in the comment section. They're really good, I read them all. And they're useful, they help give me ideas. Um, and feedback is good, I don't care. I appreciate negative feedback, I appreciate positive feedback, I appreciate bad comments. I appreciate good comments. It doesn't really matter. And we, we can't all think the same. It's okay. But in any case, it gives me, uh, uh, I guess, food for thought. And it gives me, uh, even the bad comments give me food for thought. They get me thinking and get me seeing if I'm looking at something in an incorrect way. Because uh, I like, to, I, I also use this YouTube platform or this, 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 uh, this phenomena as a testing ground for my own knowledge and to see where I'm at in a lot of ways. And and sometimes, you know, you get a few elbows, it's it's healthy. So I don't mind. I you know I, I don't mind, you know, it doesn't I'm not a uh into uh just PC talk. You know, if there's something uh you want to say, just say it. Don't worry about it. All right. Just uh just understand that I appreciate both, right? Now in terms one more thing before I go into the topic. In terms of deleting comments, I am guilty of deleting a few comments, not because they were bad comments. It's just sometimes I, instead of clicking reply, I click delete for some reasons. My thumb or my finger, when I go to choose the option to reply to the uh, comments, sometimes I delete it. And uh, I don't know why, um, uh, like if you look at, if you go into the comment section, there's two kind of ways you can do it, two or three ways you can do it. One of the ways doesn't give you an alert that you're deleting the comment. It just deletes it. Um, so I've done that. So guilty as charged. But I have had people in the past when YouTube was going through this, um, just uh, particularly during COVID, where they were just deleting comments and, uh, and, and doing things like this when people were saying certain words and things like this. I haven't had that much lately, so I've been persevering. Uh, but my real aim really is to build up uh, Buddhist.cafe now. And when Buddhist.cafe has the capability to do videos and things like this, I may consider very strongly stopping YouTube videos and just putting videos up on there when we have that capability one day, if we will, one day. And that all depends on you and how many, how many people subscribe and how successful that site is. So again, it's a community project. We all, uh, we all need to work together, learn to work as a team, because uh, that's how Buddhism grows, right? Okay, so today's topic, again, shout out to Love Udon. Uh, he asked me a question, or she asked me a question, or they asked me a question. Uh, I'm not gonna say all the pronouns, um, but, you know, uh, to, me, oh, to me, this whole pronoun thing, I look, if someone tells me to call them something, I'll just call them something. I don't care. It doesn't bother me, right, personally. Um, but, uh, like, if I don't know the person, that's where I draw the line. Don't expect me to know. So, usually I'm quite polite with people. What would you like me to call you or how do you want me to address you? Then you tell me and then I'll address you. In that case, I don't really care. Here in Thailand, it's, it's quite common to ask someone how they want to be addressed. People can have many names here in Thailand, particularly in the Buddhist world, because you have your, uh, like as a monk, you have your monk name, um, there's nicknames, um, and also being in on an international level, like for example, uh, my name is, my birth name is Giorgio, for example, right? Which is, I just said it in with an Australian uh, accent, right? 
but in, in Italy it's Giorgio, right? But in, in America and in, in, in uh, Australia they call me Giorgio. Giorgio. <laughs> in America it's Giorgio, something like that, right? Um, so yeah, name can change, right? So for me, names don't really, as long as you know you're being addressed, that's fine. But some people are very sensitive about this. So, <clears throat> but just so you know, as far as um, where I stand on um, that stuff about pronouns, I just don't think it should be law. You know, I, I think everybody has a right to be called what they want to be called. It doesn't mean you're going to be called what you're going to be called. You can't expect that from people. I don't expect that from people. Like, for example, in the Buddhist monastic code, the Buddha makes it clear in a lot of ways that you sh uh, that lay people should refer to monks as bante, for example. That doesn't mean lay people refer to us as bante. Yeah, they don't. You know, I know people that call me by my first name and I say, well, you shouldn't be. A, but they, but their argument is they're not Buddhist. Right. So why should I inflict or why should I impose? Right. They're not Buddhist, but they're not respecting the fact that I'm a monk. So this is a big argument. Right. And one that will just go back and forth. But the question is, what's the peaceful way? As far as I'm concerned, like what will bring me peaceful? What will bring me peace and happiness? And this is well. Yes, I should be called Bante, uh, technically speaking, by all lay people, but but all lay people aren't necessarily Buddhist, right? And we live in a big world. So I also have to learn to shift the gears and not put that expectation on every person I come across, right? I think that's peaceful for me. That'll give me more peace. At least I don't have to worry about it so much and walk around saying, you need to call me this and call me that. But you know what? I could be wrong. On that, um, other people will see it differently, okay? But uh, to walk around expecting people to, to know uh, how to address you immediately, I think is, a, is unreasonable and creates a lot of unnecessary problems, unnecessary situations. So, you know, we're, we're on the path to peace here, not on the path to war. So, well, spiritual war, and I've talked about that as well, um, and we'll go into that some more. Uh, on another video, but I've, I've, I've dealt with that a lot on Buddhist for Truth. I'll talk about that another time. So today's topic, okay, sorry about the long, <laughs> it was a long <laughs> update today. Um, so today's topic is uh, choosing a temple or, you know, choosing a Dharma teacher, choose, like where to practice, where to start, or even when you started, how to choose a teacher and things like this which is a big question. It's, and it's, it's, it's always difficult, this one, right? And, uh, okay, so this one's a heavy one too because I need to get this right. You know, I need to get the answer correct to this one. <clears throat> so, here we go. Okay, so in terms of the novice, in terms of say you've read a book or you've heard a video like you've just come across one of my videos or any monk's videos or any Buddhist video and it says a few things and it triggers your uh, your your curiosity it triggers your your interest right it triggers your interest and you say okay I want to go and um, find out more about Buddhism or find out more about you know, teachers and things like this well logically the first place you start is, well, these days it's always the internet. It's mostly the internet these days, right? Uh, it's just the internet. We live in a whole different world than we did 30 years ago. Or when I was a teenager, there was no internet. So the only way to find out, um, sort of like, for example, when I was a teenager is like, uh, where can I go do martial arts? Where can I learn boxing? Or where can I buy this book? Well, you go to that place locally. You get on, get, I got on my bike and go to that place. These days you don't need to. Um, you just get on the phone and that's it. Which, um, or the computer, which, by the way, sometimes can be counterproductive uh, because we're, it, it takes out the personal interaction, the biological interaction between people. This could be advantageous or disadvantageous. Depends on the situation. But usually what you would do is start off with a local temple. And uh, now in Thailand, it's pretty simple. Well, 
I guess, simpler in one way, in one reason, because in Thailand, the majority of Buddhism here follows Theravada, the Theravada tradition. So if you come to Thailand, you'll more than likely find 85% of the time Theravadan temples. Although, I have to say, there's a lot of different temples here too. They're just not in the majority. There's all different kinds of religions here in Thailand, as I'm discovering more and more as I stay here longer and longer. Uh, there's all, you know, I saw a church here in Udon. There's a mosque here in Udon. There's uh, Chinese temples. There's Hindu temple here in Udon. There's all kinds of things. There's spirit houses. So coming to the question, the question uh, was directed in Australia. So I'll hit, I'll, I'll work on Australia, America, Canada, and I guess Europe too. Uh, you know, for example, in Australia, we have all different kinds of traditions, you know, the Sri Lankan tradition, which is Theravada mainly as well. But that's not to say that that's all they follow. And, you know, um, there, we have Japanese temples, we have Chinese temples there, we've got uh, uh, Tibetan uh, Zen temples, we've got uh, Vajra, Vajrayana temples, we've got sex of um, things, practices, which are like a very secluded sex, which don't really uh, kind of, uh, they kind of, don't really kind of uh, uh, identify with any denomination. They don't really identify as Buddhists or Taoists or things like this. They just, they believe in their own Dharma from their own teacher, for example. There's a lot of this there's there's a lot of this everywhere in the world and it's also here in thailand there there are plenty of people like this plenty of organizations like this in the world too right so the you know the spiritual world is is huge you know you've got to consider when the buddha came up when the buddha started uh, he went to two teachers first as we all know according to the text but he came across many different practices you know many different practices if you uh, if you read the the discourses, there's the the naked body ascetic, the the mimicking animals ascetic. There's the fire worshiping. There's the Brahmins. Uh, there's yogas, yogis. There's uh, uh, there's all kinds of uh, t torturous practice, lazy practices. There's all kinds. Of, so what has changed? Nothing much. Nothing much. This is the world, right? The spiritual. Uh, when you go into the spiritual domain, um, it you know it depends on locality, it depends on the culture, it depends on a lot of things. Okay, and Buddhism is no different to this. And this is what I want to make clear to um, to you, right? Buddhism is no different because you each temple has its own characteristics. Uh, and why? Because it depends on the teacher. It depends on how the teacher runs the temple. And it also depends on how, I guess, well-developed or... Uh, I don't like to use this word, but I, I still haven't found a, uh, a suitable word to, to, to use. But the level, the level uh, of practice that the teacher is at. But that doesn't mean uh, that the children are at the same level. Like it's like a family, you know, it's like mother and father might have 10 kids. It's hard to judge the kids, uh, to judge the, the, the mother and father by the kids. You know, so you can, sometimes you can have good kids and bad kids in the same family. It's, this is common knowledge, right? So this is where the difficulty lies. And this is what I'm trying to convey to you. It's, it's very difficult finding a perfect temple. So I would say give up on that at it. Give up on that one. Or good luck if you can find it, okay? I don't want to be negative. But uh, for me, you know, being in this uh, in, the, in the robes now for a little bit of time, um, it's, been, uh, it's been impossible to find a perfect temple. What I've found is that you find temples that work for you in certain ways. And there's always advantages and disadvantages and the buddha makes this clear for a monk anyway in the the four the four conditions 
um, there's a there's a discourse on this where the Buddha says, um, what was it? Let me think. Okay, the Buddha says, okay, if if the food is not good, but uh, but the practice is like you're developing, the teacher's helping you and you're growing well, you ought to stay there. Um, if the food is good and the practice is good and you're developing, you should definitely stay there. Now, if the food is bad, right, and the training is bad, you should definitely leave. And if the food is good, but the development is not good, you should leave as well. So there's those four conditions, which from there, uh, I guess from, from a layperson aspect, uh, I don't see why it would be any different. Now, why food? Well, because we only eat once a day uh, in this tradition, uh, in Theravada especially. And you need some, some form of uh, nutrition at least once a day otherwise it's just hard to practice right and it also depends this also depends um, on what kind of practices you do if you want to incorporate fasting there's a lot of uh, practitioners who like to fast and things like this but essentially as you get older and the body gets weaker food is kind of nutrition does become an important factor although we still eat once a day but nutrition is a, a factor and I think that's why the Buddha makes it a point, like the food has to be enough. I think, I think actually if the food is enough, the food is enough. I don't, I don't know if it was good food, but yeah, I think it's the food should be enough, ample, but the practice should be, you should be developing in the right way. So, and that's it. It doesn't say whether the kuti is hot or cold, it doesn't say uh, whether there's heating or air conditioning in the kutis. <laughs> doesn't say whether you're allowed to have a phone or not have a phone. doesn't say whether the teacher is grumpy or not grumpy. doesn't say whether some of the monks are good or bad. doesn't say, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, expand in those directions. He just talks about these two things because I guess that's the essence of all you need, right? If the food is ample and you've got somewhere to practice, that's all that matters, really. And if your practicing is growing in that community, that's all that matters. So stay there. And that's what I advise. Um, there's there's uh, many monks. There's many monks who ordain in one temple and they stay there for their whole lives as a monk. There are monks who ordain in a temple and switch thirty temples. You know, there there are monks here in Thailand that uh, are on the road all the time, except during the rains, where they have to stay in one place for three months but other than that they still move around so it depends on the characteristics of the monk and uh it's also um some monks like to stay in caves and in in uh stay in solitude but during the rains they have to go to a place uh that's in a community or that has like a they can't stay in a cave during the rains as far as i know unless the cave is suitably built in a certain way where it resembles because during the rains we're not allowed to travel and we have to stay in one place so i don't know how that actually works i'm not sure if when monks stay in caves during the rains they go out and stay in their local temple or not or whether they stay in the cave i think it depends on the condition whether the cave is suitable or not uh, and can protect from the rain but i think but the general rule is uh, during the rains every monk should be somewhere like with in, in a safe place and not move for three months that's the general rule so in terms of choosing a teacher and uh, choosing well this is interesting as well because uh, sometimes the teacher comes to you there's an old saying the more you practice when you're ready the teacher will appear there's there's a bit of truth to that there is there is a bit of truth to that certain conditions coming it's kind of timing and karma and things working together that brings you to meet someone who can help you or that person just appears in your life that can happen too but be careful of that because imagination can 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 get in your way of that and you could you could be looking for that and then you could assume that that person that appeared could be it and then you could be wrong so be careful with that analogy 
when you're ready, the teacher will appear. Be careful of that one because there's, there's a bit of imagination can help you to make a lot of mistakes there, right? So in, in the case of going to any temple, um, see, for example, in Thailand, start off with Thailand. I know I started with America and, and Australia, and I, again, I, I want to stress, there's many different traditions, particularly in America. Europe too. Europe has a, um, a lot of different traditions there, a lot. I know in Italy, um, there's there's a few Japanese practices that are very pra uh, popular. Uh, Tibetan Buddhism is very popular, but they have um, all kinds of temples in Italy uh, from the last time I went there. So when you're setting out as a novice, it's 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 a little bit overwhelming. Um, it's really overwhelming. So this is why we have to simplify it. It's if you're in a place, if you if you go to your local temple, like if you start off with your local temple and you're developing well and you feel like you're growing, you stay there until things change. And they may not, right? It depends. Um, it depends. So you, in other words, we have to simplify the equation here because if you try to judge the temple or the teacher by the, uh, I guess, the material things, you know, is it clean, is it dirty, is it, is the beds comfortable, uh, this, uh, you know, is it, uh, is it too hot, is it too cold, that's not the way to go, because good teachers live in hot, hot places, cold places, um, you know, it doesn't necessarily, the, the conditions can't be controlled, right, hot and cold, rain, bugs, these things can't be controlled. And sometimes you'll go to a place that's so comfortable, you'll just sleep all the time, which is not good either. So you've got to keep this in consideration. What's your aim? What's your focus? Now, if your focus is uh, the practice, practice and practice and to develop and to maybe see, you know, realize Nibbana in this life or cessation of Dukkha, then what's really important to you as a, as a I guess, as a fundamental is place of practice and enough food, enough requisites, right? I'll add requisites to that. So you, you have cloth, uh, there's a dwelling, uh, there's medicine, and there's food. So those four requisites, if there's enough, it's abundant, because that's important. Go have the basics, right? So I guess uh, those two things, fundamental things, are the most important. But when you're, I guess, in a country like uh, Australia or America where you can go to a Zen center or a Japanese center, or you can go to a Sri Lankan temple, or you can go to a uh, Chinese temple, or you can go to an Indian temple, or a, or a Burmese temple, or a Thai temple. And wow, you know, it gets, it's like a lot, isn't it? It's, uh, it's, 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 it's quite daunting. But for this, I didn't really have this problem because for me, I, I, the way I started, at least uh, in this new path, in, in when I, on the path to becoming a monk, I won't talk about what happened before. I'll do that in another video. Uh, it's not really relevant. Uh, it's more like a, my bio, right? So talking about, I saw a video, I came across um, a video with a monk from Malaysia, believe it or not, who ordained in Thailand. And he gave some few a few Dharma talks, and I was and I watched them. <clears throat> I was in New York at the time, and I watched them, and they struck me. They struck me really deeply, and uh, from there I actually went and visited him. That's what I did. I just went and saw him, uh, and stayed at his temple for five months when I got the opportunity. Uh, I didn't. I went to other temples while I was in New York, and even when I went back to Australia. Um, I went to some temples there, but uh, I really wanted to go see this teacher because of what he said had a profound effect on me. And from there, he advised me to come to, to Thailand and I've never looked back, right? I've moved on and found myself in other situations, right, in where I am now. So basically, it's it's an evolving thing and it's not a... And it's, uh, Sometimes it also depends when I was talking about the level of the teacher, right? Sometimes uh, you go to, you know, here there's 
people like to go to the highest teacher there is, but they often come back and not stay there because it's too intense. It's too hard. All right, so you got to, so this is where the, uh, the gray areas, where the difficulty uh, lies with this one, because uh, for advanced training and to have someone at a, like a real high level of practice, you, you, you have to have, you have to bring discipline yourself to it. You, know, you have to have something developed yourself. So you start where you start, you start where you can and you grow. So growing slowly, as long as you're growing, the speed at which you're growing is irrelevant. The important thing is that you're growing. And the speed of development depends on where you're at. I mean, I always try to um, bring things to practical practical things of how I see things. Like I remember as a teenager, it's like when I set out, I wanted to learn martial arts. Where do you go? Where do you go? Where do you train? And so you start off at your local place and and there's a bit of growth and and then you know some people stay in the local place and some people go to a different place and so forth and so forth same with boxing uh learning boxing uh, as a teenager or things like this because i used to be into those things but some places i went to you know, i trained there once or twice and left and one of the reasons is is because i just saw the discipline in the students and discipline of the coach and i said oh i'm not ready for this I, like I have to change my t whole life in order to do this. And, and But it was good at the same time because it gave me a wake-up call. Like, for example, when, when I was doing boxing when I was a little kid, I was doing it casually. Um, and one day I went to a, a, a gym and I met a real serious coach who had uh, some uh, champions training at his gym. And I spent a few hours there. And I just heard the coach talking to the students and to the, the champions. And uh, and it, that made me realize right there and then that I was never going to be a, a, a champion boxer because I wasn't ready to commit to that kind of discipline and lifestyle. Now, after that, I, 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 and after that, I realized, you know, I'll never learn boxing properly, right? So some of you may disagree with this, but what I'm saying is, the commitment level, what that taught me is it requires a certain commitment level. So if you want to learn boxing, want to learn just from like a, a self-defense point of view and just like a casual point of view, there's, I guess you can do the, the three hours a week kind of training. But if you want to learn boxing and you want to become a professional and champion, that requires a whole lifestyle. And that I was not ready and able or willing to commit to that at the time and that's what i learned from going to an advanced training place you could say so this is what i'm saying like even if you go to a really disciplined temple the lesson is good because it'll show you um it'll show you a lot of things about yourself it'll give you a lot of introspection uh, it'll give you a lot of feedback of where you're at and this is important to understand where you're at so if you're ready for that kind of thing or not so that's advantageous. That's a, that's a, that's a, that's a plus as far as I'm concerned. So uh, you know, there's all these things when choosing a place. It's actually very complicated. It's not simple. The 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 fact that there's many different traditions um, is 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 one that you have to navigate through. The second place is locality. Right. The second place is local. Like, uh, can you travel long distances? Are you able to uh, leave your work for three months a year? Or are you are you in that had that disposition? If I'm talking like a layperson, well, if are you willing to travel and spend the money to stay in a place for two or three months a year and commit to that, or is it a one-off thing? Like, what are you interested in? That's where the local temple comes in handy as a layperson. If you're not into that, right? Excuse me. Um, so, yeah, so there's, there's that, there's the different traditions, there's the locality, are you willing to travel, uh, what are you willing to do, uh, to go into the practice or do you want it to have to be like a, you go to work, you go to the temple, uh, on Sunday or, you know, two or three nights a week, do you want your, is your practice more at that level, right? So this is something that you have to decide for yourself, it, you have to work it out for yourself where you're at so a lot of people like to dump 
jump into the deep end straight away, which I don't blame people. It's kind of like you're sitting there at your office and uh, you, you hear the word dukkha and uh, you hear the word impermanence or you hear some very wise, um, I guess, uh, phrase and it triggers something in you, it, it, it excites you, it, 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 it wakes up your curiosity and you're just bursting to find, you just want to go out to the cave and want to go out there and, and just want to practice and do it. So I understand that. But then reality comes in and then you start to see what, you know, there's, there's, there's financial considerations, there's your situation with your, with your family, uh, you, you know, your social implications. So that sets in as well. So then you have to find a way in order to find uh, something that suits you, right? This is complicated. It's complicated, okay? It's just, that's why there's no clear-cut answer to this, right? So that's why the Buddha makes it quite simple, actually. He says, where there's enough food and you're developing, stay there. That's it, right? So, so in other words, if... If the local temple is feeding you enough dharma and um, you're getting along very well there, um, stay there. If not, go to another temple or whatever. If you're willing to travel, if you have that capability, you can. But that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to find what you're looking for. Because after all, what we're trying to find is in here. You're, what we need is an environment that, that helps you get to here. That gets you to what we're trying to realize is cessation of dukkha. You don't realize that from if, if I walk from here to there, what's the difference? When I'm trying to find when I'm trying to realize the cessation of dukkha, I don't have to walk over there when really I'm trying to realize here. Right? So this traveling, do I have to be in Thailand? Do you have to be here? Do you have to not necessarily, but it also depends. It depends on your character and what you're looking for. As a monk. Um, the reason why I'm in Thailand, right, is because I can freely go arms around in the morning. I've, I've got freedoms as a monk here because uh, that I can do. In Australia, I used to go arms around. I was starting to get stopped by the police, of all things, because I was walking um, the streets with a bowl with no shoes on. And the police started stopping me and harassing me and, and they wanted me to put me on a register and all this. So I stopped because... Not because I had any anger, but I mean, there's just going arms around. But then what struck me was something deeper was, well, you know, maybe there are Christians in the local community who find it offensive. Maybe there's Muslims who find it offensive. Maybe there's Jewish people who find it offensive. Maybe there's atheists who find it offensive. Maybe they reported it to the police. So I wasn't thinking about all these other things because... When, when I was going arms around in Sydney, for example, it's a multicultural society um, and not everybody's Buddhist. So the advantage here in Thailand is, again, not everybody's Buddhist here either, right? But uh, certain temples that have been here for a long time have established, I could say, uh, like a, a route for arms around. So I can freely practice that without being... Uh, without worrying about offending people or um, getting harassed by the local authorities. Uh, so that's one big plus about living in Thailand for me, right? Um, second of all, uh, there's just more choices um, for a monk. There's a lot of different temples. And being in the Sangha, you get to meet a lot of different teachers, and there's a lot here in, in Thailand. Right? There's a lot here in Thailand and there's a lot of choices for a monk and you can really expand. And uh, you know, when you're in the Sangha, it's a whole different world uh, for, a, for a monk, for, for Buddhism, I'm saying. I'm not saying it's a different world psychically. I'm not saying I've got powers and all that. I just have to put that clause in there, okay? I'm not saying it's a different world in that sense. Yeah, I just have to watch out sometimes because sometimes I say things and I don't, it might be taken as me saying I have something and I've got to be careful of that as a monk. So, yeah, I mean, all these things, as a lay person, I guess, as a lay person, I lost my track here for a minute because I was talking about the reasons why I'm in Thailand. Um, and that's the other reason why um, I've tried to uh, set up a, a way that, you know, I could 
maybe start my own temple in, in, in a different country. And I've got some few projects on Buddhist.cafe you can check out. Um, <clears throat> and maybe we can start because I've got some students in different countries. that I can only be in one country. That's the big problem here. So I'm also in Thailand because of that. It's neutral because uh, I, I've had offers in Australia, America, and Italy, which didn't really go to fruition. And it's also because that's the four, one of the other reasons. It's so difficult because Buddhism in Australia, for example, is not recognized. So, uh, you know, you have to step, set up a non-profit organization and that requires four executives, three or four executives, and it's a very complicated situation. Um, and then there's a whole management system. Then you've got to come up with funding. So in... Uh, in, in Thailand, Buddhism, uh, not all Buddhist temples, but they're, they're well funded uh, because people understand how Buddhism works, whereas in Australia, it's not so much that. I'm not saying people are not generous. I'm not saying people in Australia, America, Europe are not generous or are not kind. I'm not saying that. It's just that it's a different culture. It's a different culture. It's a different thought process. So sometimes I fought against it and I thought, you know what? I could use that as a training to grow and I could use it uh, in order to make me stronger. So I did it for a while. Uh, but then when I come back to Thailand, I see how it all just fits like a glove for me at least. And I can just go and do what I've got to do without too many hassles or worries. As I'm getting older, that's becoming more and more uh, attractive and advantageous, I see, because basically what do I want to do? I just need a place to practice where I can go my arms around and come back, do my practice, do some chores and have somewhere to practice where I, where it's relatively without being disturbed. And there's a lot of places here in Thailand that can offer, can offer me that. Um, whereas in Australia, uh, it's, 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 it's a little bit more complicated than that. And, uh, you know, so these are some of the things that I've had to take into consideration as a monk and as, as, a, as someone trying to follow the Buddhist path. And being in Thailand is, is difficult in a lot of ways. I have to, uh, I can't see my family. I'm, I'm, you know, but, you know, a lot of Western monks have done this for 30, 40 years, 50 years. So it's not, it's, it's not uncommon, okay? But there are a lot of monks who haven't done that. There are a lot of monks that stayed in their relative countries all day in there and they didn't go to Thailand or didn't go to Burma or Sri Lanka or China or, or Tibet or, um, or Japan, for example, right? They ordained in their country and they stayed there, right? Again, because it suits them, it works for them, right? So this is why this conversation, I'm, I'm not really going to talk about this question ever again because I think I've done it to death here. I think I've covered all bases. So as a lay person, um, I think you start off locally. If that doesn't work for you, are you willing to travel? Are you willing to spend the time? Because once you start bunny hopping, uh, or what in Australia they say pub crawling, um, I guess they say that in England too. Um, well, once you start temple hopping or t temple crawling, um, it can be a very, very exhausting and long process because it, like in Thailand alone, there's like, I don't know, I hear diff two different figures in Thailand. I've heard um, there's over 25,000 temples here in Thailand and I've heard there's over 40,000 temples here in Thailand. So just to play it safe, there's between 25,000 to 40,000 temples alone in Thailand and that does not include the hermitages, which is a different thing. They're like private places of practice, right? And that doesn't include... Um, or the other spiritual uh, disciplines here in Thailand. So you'll, you'll never get through it. So for me personally, right, after all this talking and everything, when you find a teacher or someone that is resonating with you, you stay with them um, and until something changes, right, until it's not, until you're not growing anymore. I guess, and then you move on, then you move on, uh, and I, I guess that's the way it is. Now, 
some people, like I said, right? Like I said, and to conclude on this, sometimes you find the right person um, or the right group of people and that's enough, right? Um, you know, this problem that a lot of us have is always trying to find the grass is always greener on the other side, right? It's not the case here. That can get you in a lot of trouble uh, in terms of practice. Okay, so, but again, but again, no fear, no worry, because that's an obstacle too, right? So, I mean, if something teaches you a good lesson, it's te taught you a good lesson. So sometimes it's worth, um, you know, checking out something different. Sometimes it's worth it. Sometimes it's not worth it. Sometimes it's not worth it. So it's like a friend of mine used to say, oh, I don't like to travel because if I see somewhere uh, more beautiful than the place I live in, I'll get really upset. <laughs> Uh, and uh, so yeah and that person doesn't travel um, so but reality the reality is what you really need right is to be able to practice that's the essence you need somewhere to practice and the environment does help are you a person that needs to be alone now in Buddhism it's really hard to be alone even when you go to the most fire up places, which I've tried, people people will find you. So you can't really uh, think that you're going to be finding a place. Eventually, you're going to have to go arms around, or you're going to have to eat. You're going to you need community services. The Buddha even talks about this. It's very hard to just stay on your own. And you know, okay, so if you want to be uh, a hermit, you can. But even a hermit, even a hermit relies on certain things from certain people so you're never really truly alone in that sense so that's just a romantic notion as far as i'm concerned but uh you know and and also it's healthy to have communication with other human beings from time to time anyway so you need that anyway because how do you know whether you've developed or not anyway you need you need some sounding boards sometimes which is very important there's been many cases where a monk thinks um by overestimation that uh, uh, that he's achieved, then he talks to another monk and finds out he's not. Now, if he didn't talk to that other monk and found out he's not, he'd be living in a delusion. So that's the disadvantages of being alone all the time, right? Sometimes you, you get so caught up in yourself and no one's giving you any feedback and, uh, and, and you, you're not realizing that you're not all that yet. Okay, so so being totally alone, first of all, is a romantic notion as far as I'm concerned, and it's not. It can be skillful, but it can be unskillful too. So, the the, the question is, where can you practice? Where can you get a good teaching? And where can you have the requisites? And as a layperson, where is it? Where does it work for you the best? Right. So, like if you if you have a family, or you don't want to become a monk and you want to stay in your lay lifestyle right which is fine um, what temple can offer you enough can give you enough so you can go there meditate and still grow and still keep your lifestyle now you're asking for a lot right just realize this because eventually letting go means letting go it's not a negotiation so if you're clinging to all your things as lay people, um, well, you know, you have to decide how far you want to take it, right? So these are things you have to decide for yourself. I'm not here to judge you or tell you what to do um, in this regard. That's your decision. Really your decision what you want to do here. But uh, in essence, I think if you find... Um, someone in terms of the teacher kind of like at least a guide a, you know a bit of a direction uh, and and you're feeling that you're growing with that person or and whichever or in whichever medium it may happen and you're growing with that person and that person is providing you what you need stick with it stick with it don't complicate it just stay there learn what you need to learn <clears throat> go through all the bases 
you know, learn what everything that person's teaching and then and then see what happens. And you know, if you occasionally you want to go for a stroll, go for a stroll. <clears throat> but remember, you know, like uh, if if you want to uh, learn things, you have to travel sometimes. You have to go to different schools and things like that. So are you prepared to spend the money and time to do that? So sometimes it's just good being content with the local temple and that's it. Sometimes it's that that's it. it might not be perfect, but that's but it suits the rest of the things that you're that uh, you want to do in your life. Right. So that might be the way to go. Right. So, again, you know, it's self analyzation here. It's know thyself, you know, you know, see these days we've got the beauty where you can turn on YouTube or uh, a platform and listen to many monks. There's Long Paul Sumedho on here. There's Ajahn Jeff Scott channel. Uh, Ajahn Dick Scott videos. There's uh, a lot of Sri Lankan monks with videos. Um, there's Indian monks with videos. There's there's all kinds of Zen and Tibetan videos. There's all kinds of stuff. There's all kinds of teachers here on, on YouTube. So you've got that benefit. But the problem is, which I find with that, is again, you're, it's kind of like a situation. It's kind of mental overload. So what I would say even with that is just stick with one channel and, and stick with that channel and then occasionally if you want to listen to something else, right? But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a strong believer in, in learning one thing at a time, but learn it well, right? And uh, in terms of this practice, you need, uh, it's, it's already confusing and overwhelming as it is because there's too much, there's a lot of information out there, right? And I mean, there, you know, we've got the scholars in Buddhism who get really entrenched in the books um, and do a lot of research in the books and they choose to go that way too. Um, and there's, you know, th there's a lot to be said about that too, right? But for me personally, it's the practice. So when you go to a place and you sit there and you sit with the monks or whoever's there, how do you, you know, can you sit there and meditate without anybody disturbing you do, can do they respect the fact that you're sitting there because that's important um, do they answer your questions are they welcoming things like this you know those things are important to me um, so you got to work it out yourself in this regard right so I think I've yeah if there's anything I've missed or some things that uh, you would like me to um, cover some more on this topic just leave a, uh, a question in the comments or just let me know if I've missed something or you know things like this because this is a big topic it's a hard topic it really is so uh, yeah I think I'm done on this <laughs>